When I began my career in cancer research, really nothing was known about how the disease arises. And now we know exactly why cancer occurs. We don't know all the causes, which is a problem, but we do know that once those causes have done their job, all cancer arises from the malfunction of genes. When I arrived in, to take up my position at uh, the University of California, San Francisco, I met Warren Levinson, who was another newly recruited young scientist who had been trained to study Rouse sarcoma virus. Now, Rouse sarcoma virus uh, was discovered by Peyton Rouse at the turn of the 20th century and was the first tumor virus ever described uh, to any credible level. It was a historic discovery and it was utterly neglected for over 50 years. The, the, this was a chicken virus. This virus was discovered in chickens originally. And did it bother me that it was a chicken virus? Not at all. I was a great believer in what we call the universality of nature. And if I could find out anything about cancer in a chicken, I knew it would apply to humans. And boy, was I right. The biological effects were dramatic. You could take normal chick, chicken fibroblasts in a petri dish, put Rouse sarcoma virus on it, on those cells, and within 24 hours, they, their whole phenotype changed. Their appearance changed. Their replicative behavior changed to be more aggressive. They, they started crawling over each other uh, in, a, in a chaotic manner like cancer cells can do. And of course, if you put the virus into a chicken, you would also get a tumor. Uh, that's what Rouse had originally done. That's how he discovered the virus. Um, he took a tumor, uh, lysed the cells, put it through a filter to take out any uh, living cells, uh, put that lysate, or filtrate as we called it, uh, into, uh, into chickens and they would get the same tumor and he could make extracts from that tumor, filter it, put it in another chicken and get a tumor again. Hence Rouse sarcoma virus. Another very important discovery was made that was overshadowed to an unfortunate uh, extent by the discovery of reverse transcriptase and that was a discovery made by Stephen Martin at the University of California Berkeley. Um, that Rouse sarcoma virus had at least one gene, and it turned out to be only one gene, that was responsible for the tumorigenic capacity of the virus. And that brings me to Harold Varmus, who joined me as a colleague in um, 1970, the year that reverse transcriptase was discovered, and two years after I started my work at UCSF. Harold um, uh, joined me in an extremely informal uh, process. Uh, he had been a, a postdoctoral fellow at National Institutes of Health and um, had, be, had taken a course in tumor viruses. He was, he was working at the time with phage and bacteria. And I think about five minutes into the conversation, I decided we're going to get this guy in a lab because he was obviously very smart. And we were on the same wavelength, scientifically. We wanted to do molecular biology on the virus. Uh, and we shared other interests, cultural interests, um, particularly literary interests. We decided that we ought to look for SARC in normal cells. Now, this was well before recombinant DNA. If we'd had recombinant DNA, we could have done the subsequent experiments in a few months. As it is, it took four years. Uh, and here we were helped, again, by genetics. Uh, Peter Vogt, um, a long-standing collaborator of ours, Peter Vogt was a master of the biology of these viruses and the genetics, and he had isolated mutants in Rouse sarcoma virus that were deletions of SARC. So we had available to us the deletion mutant, which had no SARC or very little piece of SARC in it, uh, and of course, we had the full Rouse sarcoma virus genome with SARC in it. So the, the idea was that we would copy, use reverse transcriptase to copy the genome of Rouse sarcoma virus into radioactive DNA, 
And then we would use the deletion mutant to fish, to, to pull out uh, by molecular hybridization. We would use the deletion mutant to pull out all of the nucleotide sequences of the replicative genes and leave the SARC nucleotides in the, in the residue, if you will. Uh, it worked like a charm. Uh, it was hard work. Uh, the first hints that it would work came from uh, a postdoctoral fellow named Rama Reddy Guntaka. But he had a full-blown project well underway, and once he had shown that we could probably make a probe this way, we recruited uh, another postdoctoral fellow, Dominique Stalin, um, to run with it, and he did in spades. Uh, we began to make this SARC-specific probe. We, we were very able to demonstrate its specificity in a variety of ways. Uh, he, he was able to make this probe consistently uh, and to use it, and um, soon found that the probe would react with normal chicken DNA. If you want to um, use the probe to uh, um, assess the presence of the sequences in the probe in DNA, you first have to take the DNA apart, uh, denature it, as they say, the strands separate. And then you put the radioactive probe in there, and you allow the, the strands to reassociate. And the radioactive probe gets taken up in the mix. And so although the bulk of the DNA will reassociate with its unlabeled original complement, some of it will re with the radioactive probe. There was something in the DNA of normal avian cells that was homologous to the oncogene, the cancer gene of Rouse sarcoma virus. And we called it cell SARC for the sake of the argument. If you fiddled with the reaction conditions, the probe would react with DNA from any avian species we tested, including the most primitive species, such as uh, ostrich, or the, uh, the so-called ratites, ostrich, the emu, the rhea. Uh, incidentally, it was not easy to come by the DNA for these creatures, but we managed one way or another. I, I vividly remember uh, the morning that Dominique uh, brought us the first positive results. Uh, they'd come in a late Saturday evening when Harold and I, who were in a partnership at the time and lasted for 15 years, uh, first saw the data. Um, I, I was dumbfounded. Uh, I recognized that this was a heretical uh, discovery and that we were, going to have to, we were going to have to construct an airtight argument. So I think I was a little less enthusiastic than Dominic would have liked, because he was beside himself <laughs> with excitement. Um, but Harold and I both understood from the get-go that if this was real, um, we, were looking, we were looking at a possible entree uh, to the very fundamental underpinning of cancer. By the, the time I gave my Nobel lecture, uh, I had a slide with something like 30 retroviral oncogenes, each of which had a demonstrable proto-oncogene uh, progenitor, if you will, uh, in normal cells. And as, they, as the number mounted, it became clear that here was, here was the makings of a, fun, uh, of a, of a, a unifying theory of cancer. And um, we were cautious about how we stated that uh, publicly at first. But by the early 80s, I was using that term, a unifying theory of how all cancers come about. It was a gradually building thrill to realize that we had the cancer cell by the neck in terms of understanding it, not in terms of throttling it, but in terms of understanding it.